Hello everyone and welcome to an adventure. Uh, I'm uncertain how loud the music is. It's really loud in my ears today and so I don't know. If, uh, if it's loud for you, please do let me know. Um, I'm hoping that you can hear me and that the music is not really loud for you. Um, but welcome to Archival Adventures. I am um, Rogan27, Anthony Wright de Hernandez. Um, here streaming on the twitch.tv slash VTUL studios and twitch.tv slash Rogan27. Um, so uh, just give me one second here. I'm <clears throat> looking at my sound settings. <coughs> okay, so the music is good for you all. It's just loud for me. Um, Hannah, thank you for weighing in on the music and I hope that you enjoy your lurk. Um, <clears throat> well, we'll go with it. It might be the headphones that I have on today. I don't know. Ah, hi, Soypot. <laughs> thank you for uh, commenting on the levels there. Um, it is Wednesday. It is the end of February. I have a random collection that we selected today to look at um, that I know very little about and you know we're gonna have some fun looking at it but before we get to that I do want to do the land and labor acknowledgement as I typically do <clears throat> so I'm just gonna read that. Uh, Virginia Tech acknowledges that we live and work on the Tudelo and Monacan people's homeland and we recognize their continued relationships with their lands and waterways. We further acknowledge that legislation and practices like the Morrill Act of 1862 enabled the Commonwealth of Virginia to finance and found Virginia Tech through the forced removal of Native nations from their lands, both locally and in Western territories. We understand that honoring Native peoples without explicit material commitments falls short of our institutional responsibilities. <clears throat> through sustained, transparent, and meaningful engagement with the Tudelo and Monacan peoples, and other Native nations, we commit to changing the trajectory of Virginia Tech's history by increasing Indigenous student, staff, and faculty recruitment and retention, diversifying course offerings, and meeting the growing needs of all Virginia tribes and supporting their sovereignty. We must also recognize that enslaved Black people generated revenue and resources used to establish Virginia Tech and were prohibited from attending until 1953. Through Inclusive VT, the institutional and individual commitment to Utprosim that I may serve, in the spirit of community, diversity, and excellence, we commit to advancing a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive community. <coughs> Hi, Fluid Ann. Uh, so thank you all for, um, you know, being supportive of me reading that every time I go live. Uh, I do think it is important, and so I thank you for supporting me in that, uh, which I have definitely gotten feedback that you all like that I do that. So we will continue to do so. So today <clears throat> I have selected the Winifred Parsons Architecture Notebook that honestly I don't even know exactly how I came across it, whether it was just searching finding aids or just wandering through the, the shelves and seeing it. I think it was probably the former. Um, but it is an individual item <clears throat> that is in a box. 
I could show you. Most of our single item collections are in a folder because they're small. This is a single item and this is the box for a notebook. Uh, so we're going to have some fun looking at this, seeing what we can learn about it. Um, let me tell you a little bit about it. <clears throat> so the general description, the collection consists of a bound notebook containing about 800 cyanotypes, 300 half tones and process illustrations, and 32 hand illustrated images of architecture ranging from ancient Egypt until 1900. The notebook is an expandable binder filled with leaves of lined notebook paper signed by a Winifred Parsons and, though undated, appears to have been made for a class assignment sometime between 1900 and 1906. The categories of architecture in the notebook arranged chronologically are listed as Pyramids, Assyria, Mycenae, Greece, Rome, Medieval, Byzantine, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance, 18th century United States, and classical American buildings. Next to the images are notes carefully copied by Parsons about each category, as well as marks and comments from an instructor. <clears throat> so, oh, and Lord Portico beat me to dropping the finding aid. Um, Thank you, Lord Portico, for dropping that there. I do have it ready to go here uh, for the other channel. Let me just grab it, and I will drop that in chat as well. <coughs> Pardon me. But how about we take a look at what this notebook actually looks like? As I pull it out of the box, which is interesting in and of itself. So I take off the lid and it is large book. I'm actually inverting the box to take it out. <laughs> so this is the item that we are looking at today, this single notebook. Um, oh, <laughs> hello 16-bit Eric. Uh, welcome in Whimsies. Uh, welcome to Archival Adventures where I share items from the archives at Virginia Tech. Um, and yeah, it's good to see all of you. Hello, that Callisto. Hello, just here for coffee. Um, <laughs> Soybot, uh, Geek Outs, Lord Portico. Uh, oh, yes, indeed. Thank you, Moobot. Uh, anybody who was here and doesn't already watch 16-Bit uh, Eric, do go over and check out 16-Bit Eric. Drop a follow. Just here for coffee. I like big books and I cannot lie. Hi, Rykar. Uh, Be Right UK. Thank you for the bits. Um, <laughs> that's not a book. This is a book. Um, <laughs> Hello, Thorkel. It is a big notebook. Um, it's just your campaign notes for levels one through three. <clears throat> so today we are focusing on the Winifred Parsons Architecture Notebook which you can see here next to my head. Uh, and we are gonna explore this. Um, for those who just joined, uh, I, will, I will go ahead and drop this link one more time here in case you are curious and want to um, read a little about it. It's just a little novella. Um, so this is the class notebook. We don't know what class it's for of a Winifred Parsons uh, from around 1900 to 1906. We're not sure of the exact date, but it is a notebook of notes that she took for uh, some sort of architecture class at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> and the topics, uh, topics covered in the notebook, pyramids, Assyria, Mycenae, Greece, Rome, Medieval, Byzantine, Romanesque, Gothic, Renaissance, 18th century United States, and Classical American buildings. Uh, it has about 800 cyanotypes in it, 300 halftones and process illustrations, and 32 hand-illustrated images of architecture. So um, we're going to make our way through it and see what it's all about. Uh, hopefully it will be entertaining and interesting. Um, 
I say hopefully, but honestly, most things are when you really sit down and look at them. Um, the things in the archives, sometimes it's like, well, why is this in the archives? But they're all really interesting. Uh, so <clears throat> we don't know much about Winifred Parsons other than that she was studying architecture between 1900 and 1906. Uh, I'm going to switch. I have a top-down camera here that will um, allow you all to see the notebook. Um, as you can see, the top, so the, the cover of the book is not as wide as the pages. Let me see how best I can get this camera situated to show you all. I may need to raise it up. Because <clears throat> this book is thick with a double C. Um, but you can see here the cover is not as wide as the pages. Uh, the top cover is actually also not attached anymore. It has uh, torn off. So, but you can see inside the top cover, Winifred Parsons Architecture. So that's, that's how we know Winifred Parsons is associated with it. <clears throat> so part of today's adventure is uh, me trying to read script from the early 20th century. Uh, from Michael Angels? A-N-G-E-L-S, it looks like. Uh, to build, to build, that is the great, nope, sorry, that is the noblest art of all the arts. Painting and sculpture are but images, are merely shadows cast by cast by something. Cast by natural things? No, that's not what it says. I don't know what it says. I have a feeling this is actually a poem that you could look up if you wanted to, but... <clears throat> uh... Hmm. I'm going to see, because I... my, my brain stopped processing this handwriting partway through. Nope, I, I don't know. Anyway, we won't spend tons of time on that. You're amazed at how well-preserved the paper is. Honestly, this is quite quite good. It's a little yellowed, a little bit, um, but it's been in a notebook. So the place you'd see the weathering the most would be on the edges. And indeed, those are the most yellowed, the most weathered. Um, <clears throat> Store or canvas having in themselves no separate existence, architecture existing in itself and not in seeming. Is something it is not surpasses the we're gonna struggle today with some of the handwriting yay <laughs> you're used to cheap paper used in paperbacks um, substance shadow oh it's Henry Longfellow it's from Henry Longfellow let me see if I can get the actual full text <clears throat> Aha! I will attempt. Ah, okay, so it is, uh, um, so it's from Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, this, this quote that is copied into the beginning of this notebook. 
Ah, to build, to build. That is the noblest art of all the arts, painting and sculpture are but images, are merely shadows cast by outward things on stone or canvas having in themselves no separate existence. Architecture, existing in itself and not in seeming a, sh a something it is not, surpasses them as substance shadow. <laughs> Um, but yeah, this is, uh, I would say this paper, if you're at all familiar with the composition notebooks, um, from like school, hang on, I'm, I'm rolling over the headphones. <laughs> Give me one second. Um, but if you're at all familiar with composition notebooks, um, the black and white sort of marbled ones, um, I'd say the quality of paper is similar to that. Uh, it's just older. <clears throat> so it's, it's ruled paper. It's got, uh, it's not even what we would call today college ruled. It is just ruled paper. So the blue lines and the single red line down the side to indicate the margin. Um, I don't know, I may try lifting the camera today because this might actually make it easier for you all to see the book, because it is a thick book. <clears throat> yeah, notebook paper is very similar today to what it was 100 years ago, as evidenced by this book. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Winifred apparently put quotation marks around Henry Longfellow's name and did not put a close quote at the end of the quote, and that has been corrected in red ink. Um, oh boy. <laughs> As I said, I'm gonna struggle a little bit with this handwriting. It's, it's okay though. Uh, I, now that I've lifted it up, I'm gonna zoom in. Um, because, you know, consistency is not a thing this show does well. Uh, architecture. Where may the... Nope, nope, I'm not, I can't make this word out. Architecture may be true architect, uh, true architect. Applied when a building combines there be applied beauty and wow, it's really loopy writing and very, very, very difficult to make out. Uh, beauty and grace with stability and to a building and shows the purpose for which it was built. Consistency is the bugaboo of a small mind. Okay, I had not heard that one before. Uh, discuss the pairing, discuss the painting and sculpture are <clears throat> relative in Initiative, architecture is creative. Pra uh, architecture is creative practice of some of these thoughts end without finishing. Architecture is creative practice of, and then uh, we could do without painting and We could do without painting and paintings and sculpture. What? Oh, it's because I'm not reading it well. Uh, this is a prompt and this is an answer. Discuss the relative use, or no, discuss the relative in practice of Paintings, sculpture, and architecture is the, the prompt. 
And B right UK got there before I did. The, the text in the margin is separate from the text after the margin. A, fo a foolish consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds adored by little statesmen and philosophers and divines from Emerson in Self-Reliance. Thank you for the full and proper quote, Thorkel. <laughs> um, paintings and sculpture are imitative. Architecture is creative. We could do without paintings and sculpture, but not without architecture, for it is used to shelter us. It also employs many men who need work. <laughs> you find it ironic as an engineer. So early 20th century, from the perspective of someone studying architecture, clearly stating that paintings and um, painting and sculpture are not as important as architecture because, well, architecture provides shelter for us and gives people jobs. <laughs> Doesn't like art without utility, it seems, because jobs. Yeah, um, I, I would, I would philosophically take issue with that myself. But uh, let's see. Now, uh, let me read the first one again, if I can. Um, when may the true architecture be applied to a building? The true architecture may be applied when a building combines beauty and grace with utility. and shows the purpose for which it was built. <clears throat> Capitalism is garbage, part 1906. <laughs> the shelter argument is valid, but that doesn't mean that painting and sculpture aren't without, are without merit. Indeed, indeed. Um, so, yes, architecture in some ways provides shelter. Uh, I would rather say architectural engineering provides shelter. Architecture as an art form does not. Uh, this is personal opinion on my part. Um, painting and sculpture and other expressive arts, though, provide a different kind of shelter. They provide for our mental shelter. Uh, they provide for creative expression in the viewer as well as the creator. They provide for inspiration and um, they give something to us mentally that is lacking from, say, a brutalist architectural construct. Uh, brutalism being <clears throat> the type of architecture that has flat front buildings that are made of concrete uh, with square windows and they're very solid and um, it was a movement in architecture for a long time and there are a lot of brutalist constructions around the world. Uh, I'd say brutalism, uh, if you think of the architecture that you would associate with Soviet, uh, with the Soviet Union from the 1980s, um, you're probably going to end up thinking of brutalism. And while as an artistic form of architecture, it was definitely a movement of its own, um, there's something that it lacks that you get from, say, 1930s architecture uh, when you have the Art Deco styling uh, that is applied at the end of construction. Uh, so I would say that architectural engineering provides shelter, but architectural expression, such as art deco or brutalism, is the same as painting and sculpture in what it provides to us in the world. <clears throat> one architecture to rule them all, one architecture to find them, one architecture to bring them all, and in the darkness bind them. <laughs> oh, hi, Telly Island. 
I think you've commented earlier and I just missed it. Um, but it's good to see you. Hi, Puddle Glum. We have such going back to cave paintings, which are funnily enough, predating architecture. Indeed. <laughs> oh, congratulations on getting out of your meeting early, Puddle Glum. I do need a sip of water. I've just, we've been having uh, a lot of rain here, which makes my sinuses um, unhappy. <clears throat> and I think I just coughed into the microphone when I meant to, uh, I, I think I just coughed into the microphone when I meant to shield from the microphone and I apologize profusely. Um, I am very sorry about that. Let's take a look at what the third question was. <clears throat> Which of the arts most truly represents the character of the period. The character of the period. Answer, amazing. So surprised by this answer. Which of the arts most truly represents the character of its period? They answered, architecture. I never would have anticipated that that was the answer. Because as because as pictures prove something, or their tastes and opinions more liable to show this large buildings and which are so much in evidence and in which <clears throat> I'm not making out 100% of the words in this answer, and the answer doesn't end on a complete sentence. Architecture, because... As pictures have migrated, or their tastes and opinions changed, they are more liable to show this change in the large buildings which are so much in evidence and in which it is necessary for them to be continually, period. Ah, no, I get the sentence. <clears throat> Picked at very strange, because as pictures have migrated or their tastes and opinions changed, or as painters, no? Not sure. Uh, have migrated or their tastes and opinions changed, they are more liable to show this change in the large buildings, which are so much in evidence and in which it is necessary for them to be continually. I don't understand this answer. You've always liked Stephen Fry, Oscar Wilde's take on the value of art. Oscar Wilde quite rightly said, all art is useless. And that may sound as if that means it's something not worth something, <clears throat> but if you actually think about it, the things that matter in life are useless. Love is useless, wine is useless, art and love and wine. Uh, uh, art is the love and wine of life. It is the extra without which life is not worth living. Yeah, I was not familiar with that um, statement on art from Oscar Wilde, but thank you, Soybot, for, for sharing that. Um, I think that kind of encompasses <clears throat> the discussion that we were having before. You have a heavy cold, so it all sounds familiar to you. 
Yes! Uh, congratulations on testing negative. <laughs> oh, and I see, uh, I see uh, the pleasantly twisted emotes there, Telly Highland. Those are some good emotes. Uh, let's turn the page. <laughs> we spent a while on page one of this very thick notebook. So um, the next page, we have a map of Egypt <laughs> that appears to be um, a cyanotype, which is just the blue, the pl blue printing process. It might not be a cyanotype. It might just be, I I'm not sure. Uh, there are some later that are definitely cyanotypes. <clears throat> but so we are starting with ancient Egypt in this book. Historic styles of architecture. Uh, oh, got it. I don't know why I'm struggling so much with this, this handwriting, but um, this was not the word I expected to see here, so it took me a second. Historic styles of architecture. Pagan, Egyptian, Assyrian, Greek, and Roman. <clears throat> and then we have the 5th to 10th century Christian church, which is... Um, Basilica? Is what it says there. 10th to 12th century Christian church, Romanesque. 12th to 15th century Gothic. 15th to present Renaissance. Yeah, it says Basilica. It just took me a, again, but it was pagan. Pagan was the word that I was not anticipating seeing written there. It is used in one of its definitions, which is anything non-Christian is pagan. That is a, one of the definitions of the word pagan in the English language. So I just had not anticipated seeing it in a notebook on architecture. Um, so we start with Egyptian architecture. To what part of Egypt are the... To, in what part of Egypt are the... are the something dust monuments and why? My brain insists on seeing I-L-D-E-S-T and I know that's oldest. Thank you, oldest. It is oldest. My brain was processing it as an I instead of an O. Um, and honestly, this is a great illustration of um, when you're working with old documents that are written in script. So this is script um, from, the, uh, from the aughts, the, the 19 aughts, from the very beginning of the 20th century. Um, if you go back 40 years prior, there will be a significantly greater tilt to the handwriting. Um, depending on period and place and the, the person actually penning the item, sometimes um, letters like N's and M's and R's and, and all of those little ones that are just lots of bumps end up being just straight lines. And you have to infer from the T's and H's and G's and whatnot what letters go between because they didn't actually write them, they just wrote a straight line where all of the bumps are supposed to go. Uh, this isn't that. This, when there's an N, you can see it's got up, down, up, down, that it almost looks like two letter I's just without dots, but it's actually the letter N. Um, <clears throat> the G's are rather strange in this handwriting, uh, but characteristic enough that you can see them. Um, this is definitely an O, and I can see it now that you all helped me see it. It doesn't mean I will always see it, but... Um, so when looking at a document, especially a lengthy document, you can learn their handwriting over time. There are specific handwriting characteristics here, and once you identify what a letter looks like, like 
the way they write their lowercase g's. Um, even if you're getting stumped on a word, you can break it down letter by letter and be like, well, this is a lowercase g, and this is this, and this is that, uh, to work it out. And even then, sometimes you will just not be able to parse it. And that's when you have another person come and look at it and try to figure out for themselves what the word is. Uh, typically, a first pass at transcription for a historic document like this, you'll go through, you'll transcribe line by line each, le each word. Uh, so if I was transcribing this, I would be in, a, in like a, a Google Doc or a Word Doc or something, and I would type out historic styles of architecture, and then I would move to the next line because it's the next line down. It says pagan Egyptian. So even if I had more length, uh, you break the sentences on the same, at the same places where they are normally broken, or where they're broken in the handwritten document. <clears throat> and you just are doing your best to type it. And if you get to a word that you cannot make out yourself, um, you'll sometimes do a best guess, and that'll go in brackets with a question mark to indicate you're not certain of that word. Um, and if you get to a part where you just absolutely cannot make out what's there, it could be because there's damage, maybe water got on it and, and the ink ran or something, and it's just not possible to tell what's there, you'll put in brackets unintelligible um, to indicate you know there's something there, you just don't know what it is. And then, typically, uh, you would then give the document to another person to go through the transcription and see if they can see if they concur, see if they agree with what you transcribed words as, um, and if there's disagreement, then you may end up doing adding the brackets and the question mark to say you're not 100% certain. Um, but also, if they come across things that you were struggling with, they may get them right away because handwriting. Um, somebody's handwriting that's really difficult for you might be really easy for somebody else, and vice versa. Sadly, these days, if you try to write cursive text, uh, you're very unlikely to be able to read any of it. <laughs> and to think you used to be able to write sufficiently clearly for examiners to assess for three hours at a time. Um, the ends in this book look, look a lot like used. Yeah, indeed. Um, Old enough that you started writing in cursive, but when computers came in, it was all over for you. Can't write joined up anymore to save. Yeah, I have to. I have to actually concentrate to do um, to do actual like cursive handwriting. Uh, if I'm just printing, I can go pretty fast. But if I'm trying to do cursive, I have to concentrate, and that's because it's not something that I've done a lot of since I was in like middle school. Um, that said, the, a lot of the students that we get today um, uh, who come to us as student employees and we're trying to have them do transcription work, we're starting to get students who've never even been taught cursive letters and having to actually teach them the letter forms so that they can then do transcription. Um, because a lot of primary schools, a lot of K through 12 schools in the U.S. no longer teach cursive writing at all. Um, because it's not something that we commonly use in everyday life. So aside from a font that is in cursive on the computer, they're not likely to ever encounter it. Uh, but that means that sometimes we have to do some remedial instruction there in order to have them uh, have the skills that they need to be able to do the transcription work that we're asking them to do. <clears throat> and I never actually learned um, proper touch typing. Um, I have my own method of doing it and it is not the proper way, <laughs> but I am still pretty fast at it. It's very weird to you that cursive is even considered a separate skill in the US. Um, so it, what's funny is it didn't, like when I, was, when I was growing up, when I was in K through 12 school, it was referred to as cursive. But if you go historically, it was just called handwriting. Um, and 
there wasn't a lot of distinction. Like it was, it was the handwriting that people were taught. People weren't really taught letter forms in print versus letter forms in cursive. Uh, they were just taught cursive. And now we've sort of flipped. People learn their letters, but it's print letters, which are easier for little kids to get, the individual letters. Um, but yeah, it is, it's just a, a change, and there are definitely many things that instructors have to spend their time on. Um, and I just know that we've reached the point where we have 18-year-olds who have never encountered uh, cursive handwriting now. So uh, here we got, we've got some cyanotypes. We have the pyramids at uh, that is definitely pyramids at Giza and the Nile. I don't know why Giza is spelled G-I-Z-E-H. Uh, but that is the pyramids at Giza and the Nile, is what it says, because that is definitely a G and a Z in the middle with an I between them. Um, but it, it's spelled G-I-Z-E-H, uh, and we have a cyanotype here. Are you all familiar with what a cyanotype is? Um, I will look up an actual definition. <clears throat> so, well, an actual definition. Uh, I, I will just read to you from our favorite source for general primer knowledge, the Wikipedia. Uh, <laughs> cyanotype is a photographic printing process that produces a cyan blue print. Engineers used the process well into the 20th century as a simple and low cost process to produce copies of drawings referred to as blueprints. The process uses two chemicals, ferric ammonium, uh, sorry, ferric ammonium citrate and potassium ferrocyanate. Uh, sorry. Ferric ammonium citrate and potassium ferrocyanide. Um, and so this is, this is a pretty typical uh, cyanotype image. They're in denial about, you know, um, I think Thoracle, you're probably correct that it is a phonetic spelling. Where, um, where it was not necessarily a standardized spelling in the early 20th century. Some of, some of the things that we think of today as being, this is how you spell them, have had a lot of spelling variability over time, and a lot of those are proper names for other parts of the world. So, uh, here, the next cyanotype down, we have the Great Pyramids seen from the Nile. And then we have some notes. Uh, the Pyramids of the Nile on the edge of the desert. This side represented the land of darkness and death to the Egyptians because uh, the sun because the sun L E I'm not certain. Sets, thank you. <laughs> right, this is why extra eyes are helpful, because the sun sets there. Nearly all the temples are on the eastern bank. So this was why, uh, basically, why are the pyramids where they are? Um, the pyramids, the pyramids are the oldest monuments in Egypt. They were built by pharaohs of the fourth dynasty. They were the tombs of kings. Ordinary people had tombs only in the earth. Uh, these usually had two or more compartments. One containing the tablet on which their name was 
inscribed the other, the sarcophagus. So these, um, these seem fairly typical as far as uh, notes for study of architecture. I did, uh, I did a semester as an art history student and learned a little bit about architecture during that time. Um, and this kind of information is fairly typical for the study of the artistic form of architecture, um, the, the motivations behind why things are done, things like that. Um, seems fairly typical. Uh, my instruction in architecture was happening just about 100 years after this, um, I'd say more like 90 years after uh, Winifred Parsons' instruction, um, but learning this type of information about, say, the pyramids, uh, very in line with the type of instruction that I was getting in um, the art of architecture in the late 1990s. So, interesting. Um, this book itself um, is presently held together by cotton tape. This is archival cotton tape, so this is something that we have added to hold this together as a notebook. I am uncertain what was originally holding it together when we first got the book. Uh, but whatever it was either had disintegrated, deteriorated, or in some other way had failed or was failing or would have damaged the paper, uh, and therefore it was replaced with the cotton tape. Um, I don't think Kira is in chat, or we could ask her because she's the one who actually processed this book and did the description. I'm going to jump ahead because we're at 316, um, and we still were in ancient Egypt. Uh, so let's jump ahead and see where else we might go. Um, well, it looks like we've got some ancient Greece here now. <laughs> Not only do I have... Uh, their handwriting to deal with, but now it's all Greek to me, too. Um, E-R-E-C-T-H-E-N-U-S? Eric Theus? Eric Thinius? Something like that? Restored. <laughs> Um, we have the temple of, I don't think this is right. Oh, no, it's the temple of Nike. My brain looked at the word and said, this says temple of Pike, but that may be just, um, critical role and vox machina on the brain. Um, it is the temple of Nike, uh, Apteros. Uh, this is not, so we had the cyanotypes before. Oh, Thorkel, um, uh, could you let, um, Lord Portico know what link you were trying to share and, um, he can give you permission for that. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh. I am a, I am a bad streamer. Um, if you're still here, Thorkel, RTE Studios, and Tara Harkin, thank you so much for the follows um, when you all came in. I, I totally missed that those follows happened, uh, but thank you very much. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, Eric Theus was a king of Athens in Greek mythology. You were giving the reference. Um, thank you, Thorkel. Yeah, um, we have the auto mod set up to uh, prevent most links. Um, so if you do have something you want to share um, to provide context or something like that, and you want to drop a link, just um, ask one of the mods for permission. And then they can give you uh, temporary permission to drop a link in the chat. <laughs> was Nike an avatar of the Everlight? Um, I mean, Nike was a god in their own right. Um, see, now I'm, now you're asking me to remember Greek mythology. Uh, 
and it's been a while. Uh, Nike was the goddess of victory, daughter of the giant palace, and of the infernal river Styx. So Nike, goddess of victory, was the daughter of a giant named Pallas and the river Styx. So the giant Pallas was one parent and the river Styx was the other parent. <laughs> Definitely not the god of athletic footwear. Indeed, Lord Portico. Uh, so we have the cyanotypes, but then we also have um, the other, uh, these would be process illustrations, I believe. Uh, this one would be a process illustration, and then this one would be a, um, a half tone, possibly? Um, now I'm getting my formats. I'm just gonna double check because I don't want to give wrong information. and process illustration. All right, a half tone is a reprographic technique that simulates continuous tone imagery through the use of dots. Uh, so I think this would qualify as a half tone. Yes, so this, this lower one here, this is a half tone. Process illustration. Um, <laughs> oh, search, you have failed me. <laughs> the, the process illustration is a specific type of printing that my that I don't know enough about. Um, I'm guessing that this will be the process illustration, but this might also be considered a half tone. I'm not certain. Also, uh, process illustration from the way that Kira wrote in the finding aid, process illustration might just be another name for a half tone. I'm not certain. Uh, the problem is when I search for a process illustration, it shows me. Um, things about how to make spreadsheets to define processes, which is not what I'm after. Uh, and I'm not gonna spend forever searching that, but um, anyway. So this, this whole section here is giving us uh, images of some architecture in Greece. Karyatid porch from west. Karyatid porch from south. Uh, and this is um, the Erechtheus location. The mausoleum of Halicarnassus restored. So these would have been visual references. Uh, so in the study of architecture, um, looking at images of ancient buildings is uh, sort of one of the starting places for learning architectural forms. Um, so having, this is not a picture. So these here, the Karyatid porch, this is an actual picture of architectural ruins from Greece. This picture of the mausoleum of Halicarnassus um, is an illustration of what it would have looked like whole. Um, and both of them were reproduced using cyanotype technology, which common printing form, but also extremely common printing form when it comes to architecture, since this is literally how blueprints are made or were made. You're guessing the professor had to provide the images for the students? Probably, or um, so, Blueprinting or cyanotype printing was a method of reproducing an existing image. So it's possible that the student had to go and locate these and then um, 
basically made a copy using cyanotype of uh, a picture from a book. So this might be from an encyclopedia. Uh, and they went and located the image and used the cyanotyping process to create a copy of the image that they then cut out and pasted into their notebook. Um, it would be the equivalent of in like the 1970s, I'm not sure about the 70s, but definitely in the 1980s, the um, mimeograph process. I don't know exactly when mimeographing started. I know I did mimeographing in the 80s, where you would make a copy of something um, and it used that alcohol, quick drying alcohol based purple ink. Um, and uh, you could run off multiple copies really quickly of, of an item. Um, and then, you know, later on, like the 90s and 2000s and whatnot, you get things like the Xerox machine uh, that use laser printers and things like that to, to make copies. Um, no longer lurking. Work is done. Errands are taken care of. Car tie is fixed and you have coffee and a brownie. <laughs> Hannah, um, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, definitely join us for some lovely piano music and uh, pictures and architectural notes. You remember mimeographs from the 80s. You don't recall if you had it in the 70s when you were in elementary. Yeah, I don't, I don't know um, if they were in the 70s. I do know that mimeographs were a thing in the 80s. Um, and I've never done cyanotype copying myself, but I do know it was a method for copying an existing image. So that's likely why these are in cyanotype, because it would have been, uh, they, uh, Winifred would have gone and lo probably located these images herself to add to her notebook, um, and then just needed to make copies of them. So let's see, we get some architectural detail images. Um, the acanthus from the top of, from the top of, Col from the top of Colossus. Look at the way the word Colossus is written here. This is, um, again, a, a pretty typical of some of the, the handwriting when you start looking at older documents. Um, Everything after the L is just up, down, up, down, up, down. It's just the same movement over and over again, but it represents two S's, a U, and an S. But it's literally just up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, and actually looks like multiple N's in a row, given the way that she writes her N's. So, makes it somewhat difficult to read words sometimes. Let's jump ahead a little bit. I want to go past Greece. Uh, we get some basilica stuff. Well, we can, we can look at the Pantheon first, I guess. Um, we have the interior of Parthenon restored. Only meaning to words are hard. Indeed, indeed, you are correct. Uh, and then we have an acanthus for the Parthenon. An acanthus um, is a type of plant. Uh, I don't know specifically. I'm going to look it up and we will learn. Um, all right, Acanthus is a genus of about 30 species of flowering plants in the family Acanth uh, Acanthaceae, native to tropical and warm temperate regions with the highest species diversity in the Mediterranean basin and Asia. The flowering plant is nectar producing and is susceptible to predation by butterflies such as uh, Anartia fatima, and other nectar feeding organisms. Common names include acanthus and bear's breeches. The generic name derives from the Greek term acanthos 
for Acanthus mollis, a plant that was commonly imitated in Corinthian capitals, which this would be an example of a Corinthian capital. The genus comprises herbaceous perennial plants, rarely subshrubs, with spiny leaves and flower spikes bearing white or purplish flowers. You vaguely remember cranking a Gestetner machine in school? I'm not familiar with that machine, but I assume it has something to do with mimeographing. Pantheon, not Parthenon. Um, yes, and I did say Pantheon. This says Parthenon. Nope, nope, it says Pantheon. This said Parthenon, and she overwrote it to correct it to Pantheon. But you are correct. It is, it is the Pantheon. Um, which goes with the notes here <laughs> on the next page. Uh, examples of circular temples. The Pantheon. Temple at Tivoli. Uh, temple near Mouth of Cloaca. Oh, wow. Uh, ma M A X Yeah, my brain is not getting this word. Uh, M A X something. It looks like there may be an I or a T in there, because that dot could either be a dot for an I or uh, a very short cross to go across a bar, making it something into a T. Um, in parentheses after it, it says mater matuta? M-A-T-U-T-A, possibly? I'm not certain. Matula. Mater matula. I am unfamiliar. I'm going to Google. Mater Matula was an indigenous Latin goddess whom the Romans eventually made equivalent to the dawn goddess Aurora and the Greek goddess Eos. Her cult is attested several places in Latinum, and sorry, Latium. Her most famous temple was located at uh, Satricum. In Rome, she had a temple on the north side of the Forum, Boarum, Boar, Forum Boarium, allegedly built by Servius Tullius, destroyed in 506 BC and rebuilt by Marcus Furius Camillus in 396 BC. She was also associated with the sea harbors and ports where there, where, where there were other temples to her. So it still doesn't, um, it still doesn't tell me what this word is, but, um, it is possible it's Metralia? No. That was the festival. I'm uncertain. It would take a little bit of research, but uh, this is Mater Matuta, uh, meaning that we at least have a place to start that research to figure out what this is if we wanted to, if we wanted to dig in and find out. Uh, temple built in Dio... D-I-O-C-L-E-T-I-O-N, Diocletian, thank you, uh, in Palace at Spalatro, S-P-A-L-A-T-R, 
O is what it looks like. <laughs> Sparkle, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I thank you for joining. Um, we will be back again next week. Next week, we're going to look at whatever I can find in our collections about olives for reasons. So I hope that you'll come and join. <laughs> um, so yeah, a temple built by Diocletian in palace at Spalatro. Uh, temple of Vesta at the east end of the Forum. Temple at Baalbe, Baalbek is what it says. Temple of Temple of something at Rome and Temple of the same something at Palmyra. It's possibly the Temple of the Sun, but I'm not certain. Yes, olives. Olives for reasons. And hey, we're talking about Greek stuff today. So, uh, you know, somewhat of a theme, I suppose. So if I really wanted to know, I have clues here. Temple of blank at Rome and at Palmyra. Uh, I could do some research into Greek history and figure out what temples existed in both Rome and Palmyra. Um, that had short names that appear to start with an L, uh, but my brain isn't parsing the letters right now to be able to figure out exactly what that word is. But it's, I have enough that I could figure it out if I wanted to. Ooh, we've got a photo of Pompeii. Pompeii with excavations. I was very, um, I was very fascinated with Pompeii after taking Latin class for like three and a half years in high school. Hello, Tara Harkin. Uh, there's a temple of Bell at Palmyra and Rome, but you're not sure it would fit the cursive. Yeah, I I don't think it would. Because we know uh, the way she's been writing B's in here is has been uppercase, and it would make sense that that would be an uppercase. And there's definitely not a lowercase L at the end of it. But thanks for looking. That is, um, that was a good possibility. Uh... Let me see if we if we want to know. I can I can make um, wow. A quick search definitely comes up with bell, but that is definitely not the word that is written there. Uh, Palmyra. Temples. Yeah, I still don't know. The temples listed uh, on the Wikipedia article for Palmyra are the Temple of Bel, the Temple of Baal Shaman, the Temple of Nabu, the Temple of Alat, and the Temple of Baal Haman. I'm guessing this would be the Temple of Alat, uh, but it still doesn't. No, no, it doesn't seem to fit that either. I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know. 
Uh, so it would take some digging, I guess. But I'm, I'm going to move on from that. But thank you for looking and prompting me to go back and look some more. Um, so we've definitely moved. We moved from Greece to Rome. But let's see what else we've got. Oh, and uh, <laughs> Lion for Alat. Um, I, Kira, if you are there, because I saw that you were doing some mod stuff, if you can hear me, um, do you know, was the notebook, when, we, when you processed it, was it fully, was it bound with something? Because I see the archival cloth tape is holding it together now, and I was curious what that might be replacing, um, or if you added it to hold the book together. What should we look at? Oh, we've got a list of basilicas here. It was tied with the with a shoelace that broke, which is why we now and and that was um, one of my speculations was that uh, we had added the tape because what was originally holding it together was deteriorating and therefore we replaced it with the cotton tape in order to hold it together. Um, and a shoelace that broke is definitely something that was deteriorating that we replaced. So... <laughs> San Paolo Friori Le Mura? at Rome. <laughs> and that's me trying to read what is clearly a name written in Italian. Um, I do not do Italian normally. We have a list here of basilicas, their builders, where they're located, and the date they were built. Uh, Uh, Meore et Pietro? I'm not certain about that. Yeah, some of these notes, I would, I would have to have been studying um, these structures myself to be able to make out like this name. Uh, well, I mean, it looks like Pseudoxus, but I'm not certain if that is an actual name that would be a name of a builder who built a basilica in Rome in 442. I don't know. This is an interesting piece, though. I'm just looking at, like, we had already noted um, how much the note paper, the note, the, like, so this paper itself looks like the paper I used in elementary school in the 1980s. Um, it is ruled the same. It, it's yellowed over time, but it's got the top, it's got the top rule that is room for like a title. It's got the, the thin sort of blue lines, um, not college ruled, it's the wide ruled lines. Uh, it has the pink margin indicator down the side, and then she has added the red to make the columns. But the paper itself that this is on could have been the same exact paper that I was using in elementary school in the 80s. Uh, Sao Paulo, yes, Sao Paulo is... Um, But this is not, uh, so this, this is San Paolo, Friore Le Mursa, at Rome. So it's definitely at Rome, so it's, it's an Italian name of the building. Um, San Paolo Friore Le Mur, uh, Mura, M-U-R-A, I think. 
possibly Le Musa. That could be an R or an S, I'm not certain. I could find out. Oh yeah, no, totally, uh, Hannah, I, no problem. Uh, San Paolo. Ah, it is not Friori. It's, um, it's the Basilica of St. Paul outside the walls is what it translates to in English. Um, Basilica Papale di San Paolo Fuori le Mura. It's St. Paul's outside the walls. It's one of Rome's four major papal basilicas. <laughs> and I was able to read enough of it that trying to type it um, into Google at, at least got me something. Oh. Gate and wall of Byzantine Empire. A lovely cyanotype here. You've got um, what very much looks like uh, European medieval construction. Um, although medieval is a completely separate section in this book. But you can see here um, this cyanotype You've got sort of the rounded gate that's built up out of stones. Uh, the walls here with the crenellations on top. It very much looks like a medieval castle entrance, but it is the gate and wall of a of the from the Byzantine Empire, which the Byzantine Empire would be roughly equivalent in time period to medieval Europe, wouldn't it? Tomb of uh, Theodori, Theodori at Ravenna. I don't know the dates of the Byzantine Empire off the top of my head. The Byzantine Empire The eastern half of the Roman Empire, which survived for a thousand years after the western half had crumbled into various feudal kingdoms and, uh, and which finally fell to the Ottoman Turk Empire in 1453. So the, the boot of Italy and the regions of the world, uh, including the Southern Black Sea area and the Northeastern portion of the Mediterranean Sea. Um, so Greece, Bulgaria and Asia Minor uh, is where the Byzantine Empire was um, and lasted up until the mid 13th century. So let's, let's read about Byzantine architecture from uh, Winifred's notes. The new capital founded by Constantine at Byzantium was embellished by many works of art. Most of the artisans were Greek and many oriental characteristics were introduced through the structure, though the structure was purely Roman. The round arch of the Byzantine style is simply the round Roman arch practiced by an oriental people, whereas the round arch of the Roman of the Romanesque style is the same Roman arch in the hands of the barbarians of Northern Europe and the West. So language here um, that would have been common for the early 1900s, uh, using terminology to refer to um, to refer to Eastern Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, and and Eastern Asia that we would not use today. 
um, as well as, uh, but at the same time also calling Northern Europeans barbarians. So, um, you know, uh, that is using the language that the Romans would have used to refer to Northern Europe. Uh, the Romans did consider Northern European peoples to be barbarians, uh, particularly the, um, the, the people in and around uh, where modern France and Germany are and uh, the British Isles uh, were considered barbarian tribes by the Romans. Uh, plan. The dome rests upon four arches and is low, curved, thus forming the Greek cross. Thus, the side aisles become less important, and the center of the church is the point to which the attention is called. Uh, <laughs> and here we have a misidentification in the notebook. Where's your battle axe? Visigoths, Astrogoths, all those Goths. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so here we have a correction by, um, by her instructor. Uh, this is identified as the Palace of Theodoric at Ravenna. Um, and the note in red over in the margin says, not, Byz not, uh, yeah, not Byzantine. So she had uh, incorrectly identified the palace of Theodoric at Ravenna as being Byzantine, and her instructor has gone in and noted that that is not indeed the case. Exterior. Externally, the Byzantine buildings were very plain and lacking in beauty. <laughs> That's very judgmental. Uh, the impression made depended simply upon the mass. Interior, internally, the decoration was profuse. Uh, much color was used and the mosaics were in, were in a special feature. Uh, these were usually confined to the walls and vaults. The decoration presented biblical scenes or con conventional designs. The walls were sheathed in marble. The panels framed in billet. moldings, in billet moldings. Yes, <laughs> thank you, Just Here for Coffee. You, you probably got there before I did, uh, but with the delay, I, I managed to get it without, without help, but thank you. Imagine having your red pen corrections on display a century later, indeed. Indeed so. Um. <laughs> It's a very interesting piece though here. And, and I don't know what happened. It may be something to do with the writing implement, but the, the handwriting has gotten easier for me to read in this section. Uh, possibly this section was penned at a later date and her letter forms had changed a little bit over time. Um, the writing itself, seems really similar, but for some reason, this page I was able to read much, much easier than the previous pages that we've tried to read. Um, also not unusual. Let's flip ahead a bit further. We have some more cyanotypes here. Uh, Church of the something at Cologne. I say something because it has definitely uh, gotten some moisture to it, and so I can't really make out what the letters are. Uh, 
uh, church of the at Cologne. Apostles. It is Church of the Apostles at Cologne. Um, and then below it, we have the Cathedral of Spires. So these are going to be Gothic, I think. Uh, just based on looking at the images, uh, these appear to be Gothic architecture to me. Um, Let's see if we can figure out what, what, uh, based on notes, um, Hereford Cathedral, Temple Bar Church at London. So these are examples that she's giving of something. Cathedral of Worms. Is that really what it's called? The Cathedral of Worms? I'm trying to find what the actual assignment was here. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to find it. I think it's just examples of architecture. Worms, W-U-R-M-S, is a location. I was not personally aware of that. I believe you. This is, this is written W-O-R-M-S, but uh, there is a cathedral in Germany in a town called Worms. Well, I think we have a cyanotype of that Cathedral of Worms. St. Pe Peter's Cathedral. It's quite pretty, uh, all the Gothic towers on it. German. Much like Northern Italian, very fully developed, few local varieties. Um, rich in the multiplication of circular and octagonal turrets in a conjugation with polyphonal domes and the use of arcaded galleries under the eaves, doorways and capitals, most ornamented parts. <laughs> and the, the language uh, used here. Um, I'm surprised I'm getting the words as quickly as I am because uh, much like Northern Italian, fairly I easy language there, very fully developed, few local varieties, rich in the multiplication of circular and octagonal turrets in conjugation with polyphonal domes and the use of arcaded galleries under the eaves. That sentence The multiplication of circular and octagonal turrets in conjunction with polyphonal domes, or sorry, p polygonal domes, and the use of arcaded galleries under the eaves. I'm amazed that I got those words as quickly as I did, even with getting polyphonal instead of polygonal. Um. <laughs> Examples. Uh, St. Maria in Capitolis at Cologne. St. Martin, the Church of the Apostles at Cologne, uh, St. Cunibert at Cologne. I think that's what it says. C-U-N-I-B-E-R-T. Uh, cathedral at Mycenae, Cathedral at Worms, Cathedral at Spireo, Cathedral at Bonn, Cathedral at a la Chapelle. And the red pen notes, examined March 9th, excellent. Tardium excused, tardies excused. A tardiness excused, sorry. So she did good work, so the fact that she was late was excused. 
if I was to go through this book page by page and read the examination notes, I wonder if we would see a pattern of tardiness. Um, not necessarily because I have one indication here that there was some tardiness. Uh, this was the 1900s. This was the early 1900s. I don't know location of where she was studying, but 1900 to 1906, I wouldn't be surprised if she was employed somewhere doing a job, uh, and if that conflicted with her studies and made her late for classes. We could begin to, if, if the notes give a little more detail or things like that, it's possible we could begin to formulate a, a hypothetical story of what her life outside of studies was. Um, if we could identify a geographic location, it's possible we could find other writings of hers so that we could identify exactly who Winifred Parsons was and learn something about her. I think that that would be very interesting. Um, yeah. I find it quite interesting to look through this, uh, this assignment notebook and just kind of get little hints. Um, I'm, I'm flipping through pages a, a many at a time so we can move through the eras here and kind of get examples and notes from different periods um, in the time that we have. But this is really interesting. This is not an item that I necessarily would have been like, hmm, we should definitely have this in our archives. But we do have collections on women in architecture. Uh, she was definitely a woman and she was definitely in architecture in the sense that she was studying architecture uh, just after the turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century. Here we have the chapter house of Wells's Cathedral. Uh, note added to it, decorated windows. There are indeed decorated windows. Cloister of Wells's Cathedral, perpendicular. This is not the first page where perpendicular decorated. So this section is a study of some of these cathedrals. Let's see what we can figure out. Remember all the happy times we had? You know, I find it very interesting that there were just words in this song and I very definitely have it told, have it set to not include songs with words, but So this section, um, I don't know where it starts, but she's looking at decorated windows and perpendicular. Uh, I'm assuming that those are both meant to be about the windows. Um, I don't fully understand the difference myself. If somebody does, please share, because I don't know. Uh, I'm gonna bump this down just a tiny little bit more. Um, so we have Melrose Abbey in Scotland. This appears to be in ruins. Uh, it is marked as decorated. Yeah, um, Hannah, I'm not surprised that it plays during stream because I use the same channel for this stream, I use the uh, the Chill Piano channel on Pretzel Rocks, um, and I have it set to instrumental only. So it's just weird to me that there are words in this, but it shows up under the instrumental. Um, but yeah, I, I pull from the same source 
every week for the background music, so I, I don't know. And then we have Melrose Abbey, definitely decorated. We've got the interior of Melrose Abbey. Um, these are marked as decorated windows. Um, St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh. So this would be St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, Scotland. And we have an interior of St. Giles Cathedral. Um, again, decorated windows. So this, this section, she's doing a study uh, identifying decorated windows in existing architecture. Cloisters of Westminster Abbey. St. Giles still looks like that. Cool. Yeah, I, it's not surprising to me, honestly. So a number of decorated interior or decorated windows. But then, so we get... During the study, like, she definitely had this assignment where she was supposed to take these, uh, supposed to identify photographs of um, these different cathedral windows, and she's looking for decorated ones in this part. Here we have the Chester Cathedral Choir and the Chester Cathedral Cloisters. Uh, she marked them as decorated. The red notes here for the choir it says early eng period so apparently not decorated early english possibly i'm not certain um and then for the cloisters it's been identified as perpendicular rather than being um decorated, which seems like a strange dichotomy. Decorated versus perpendicular, I don't understand. Um, but if I was studying architecture, I'm sure I would find out. Let's see. Early English facade. Lincoln Cathedral. She marked it as decorated. He's clarified, or I say he, but I don't know. Her instructor has marked it as early English uh, facade in the red pen again. And this is Lincoln Cathedral, which has a very typical structure. Like the, the architecture of this building is something that we're all familiar with. We've seen buildings that look like this. Um, let's see. More decorated early English stonework. Huh. I don't understand the, di the distinctions myself. York. Let's see. Notre Dame. Canterbury Cathedral. Marked as decorated and crossed out with the note that it is indeed perpendicular. Let's see what we can learn. York Minster. Yeah. Yeah, Tully. Um, I, I moved past it. Let me see if I can go back to York Minster. Oh, here we go. Uh, York Minster is also apparently perpendicular. I'm going to look up and find out what that means, if I can. Uh, architecture decorated versus perpen. All right.
English Gothic architecture. So there are three styli stylistic um, periods in English Gothic architecture. The first is called Early English, or First Pointed, uh, and it runs from the late 12th to the late 13th centuries. The second is Decorated Gothic, or Second Pointed, and runs from the late 13th to the late 14th centuries. And the third is Perpendicular Gothic, or Third Pointed, running from the 14th to the 17th centuries. So that is the distinction that we're getting, and this exercise in the book was to identify which type of English Gothic architecture a building was, um, whether that be Early English, Decorated Gothic, or Perpendicular Gothic. Uh, so these notations of Decorated and Perpendicular with corrections uh, where this was identified as decorated, the York Minster was de identified as decorated, but is apparently actually perpendicular, meaning it is a later Gothic piece than it was identified as by Winifred. You just found a site that does a really good job of describing and showcasing pictures of the difference in the styles. Uh, Hannah, if you want to share that um, we can definitely give you permission to drop a link in the chat. Because I don't remember if I have permanent per permission for you or not, but you now have permission if you want to drop, and there's the link. If anybody is interested in learning about those different types of Gothic um, style and uh, Elixi, if you can copy that link over to the other chat, that would be helpful because I can't really access that keyboard at the moment. <laughs> so some detail of scroll work from Notre Dame in the book here. Let's see, what else, what else have we got? There's many, many time periods. Just flipping through, because we are getting close to the end, so I want to move closer to the end of the book. I want to find another section with actual notes that's not just pictures, because, haha, here we go. Um, so we've got the main entrance of Seville Cathedral. In a lovely copied illustration here. And we've got Spanish. Much Moorish influence shown in... Horse? Shown in horse, I'm not certain, I don't know this, arch and in tracery, um, that exteriors over decoration, over, de over, de flat exteriors over decoration. Yes, the artistry and skill to build these, just absolutely amazing. There's so much detail and so much work. Um, they're, they're quite pretty. Um, this architecture course that she was going through started in North Africa um, and then moved north across the Mediterranean and eastward into um, Western Europe, uh, and then I believe if we flip further, we will end up in America. So there's not really any study here of, uh, say, ancient South American architecture 
or um, indeed Southern African architecture, or which is a real thing, <laughs> there are architectural styles in Africa that are not Egyptian. Um, especially like if you go to Ethiopia, there's a lot of very unique architecture in Ethiopia. Um, nothing about Polynesian architecture, nothing about uh, indeed Asian architecture in these notes. Um, but still, some very beautiful buildings uh, in, in this Western European architecture that we're seeing. Um, I want to see, because it definitely goes into America. Here we've got France. But I, I want to flip to, to some of the really late stuff in here um, and go to American architecture if I can. Just don't know where it is. Still having castles, so likely not America. This definitely seems French. <laughs> Council chamber, where are we? Palace at H-E-R-R-E-N-C-H-I. Palace at somewhere. Uh, Heron chemise. Uh, sorry, Heron chemise, which is in Bavaria in Germany. <laughs> but definitely looks like French influence there. Um, <laughs> Fluidan got there very quickly. All right, I know it said American, which is why I'm trying to go and find American. I should just start at the back. That's what I should do. Start at the back. Nope. St. John's Cathedral. We've got cathedrals, cathedrals. Ah, some American architecture. Cathedral at Lima, Peru. We've got some South America, although it is definitely Western European in influence on South America. Uh, so not exactly what I was talking about with um, ancient South American architecture, but we have a cathedral in Peru. Um, the Palazzo de Armas and Cathedral at Lima. Old Spanish Bridge at Lima. So at least in the Americas, <laughs> um, yeah, a bit of Peru. Uh, here we've got, let's see, the Webster Mansion at Boston. Longfellow's House, Brattle Street, Cambridge. So that would be Massachusetts. We have the main entrance hall and staircase of the Boston Public Library. I always like to highlight libraries when we come across them. Independence Hall in Philadelphia. We've got a picture in here of the Statue of Liberty, Washington Arch, so a variety of things. The Corcoran Art Gallery at Washington. Wow. <laughs> so this illustration of the Corcoran here, um, the Corcoran is on uh, the mall in Washington, DC. Indeed, you can visit and see a horse-drawn carriage there today and a person on a bicycle, but this is very clearly um, the people in this illustration 
Uh, the illustration is marked 06, so probably 1906. Um, it would look very different today, and yet you could still find a man with a cane, somebody with a bicycle, and a horse-drawn carriage on the mall outside the Corcoran Art Gallery. Although the view would be very different because there are other buildings there now too. Let's see what... There were some notes at the very end from the professor, from, from the instructor. That I, I think are worth looking at as we close out today. Examined extraordinary number of illustrations. April 20, lack of care in following copies, examined, uh, presents an honorable mention. Permits? Prevents? I don't know what this word is. But apparently was evaluated and received an honorable mention. So possibly this was submitted for some sort of contest. I don't know. But that's what I take that. To, to mean that there's a possibility of at least. Um, here you can see where the, how the cover is meant to function uh, with the little flexibility here so that the cover can actually reach the edge of the pages. Although I have a feeling that just the sheer number of pages in here is why it doesn't do that. Lack of care though, yeah, yeah. It's truly an amazing piece, um, quite unique. Uh, I, I don't know what sort of like research potential it really gives for um, people who are studying architecture today, but potentially some research potential for people who are studying architectural instruction and want to know more about how uh, how architectural instruction was done in the early 1900s. Um, also just, just really unique as, a, as an item in itself. Uh, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna go back to show you once more kind of the size of this piece. This book is big. It is thick. It is as big as my head. Actually, I think ac indeed bigger than my head. Um, as we noted, the paper itself is very similar to the paper that I was using in elementary school. Um, Honestly, looks like it could have been the paper I used in elementary school in the 1980s. Uh, so quite a unique piece. I'm glad that um, I'm glad that I randomly chose to pick this one for today's stream. Um, as I said, I I did not know anything about it going in. I just saw the name and said, "Sure, we'll look at that." And I we spent two hours sort of flipping through it. We we could have spent a lot longer. Um, we didn't linger on things for very long. We didn't sit down and try to read all of her notes. Uh, we didn't look for all of the instructor's markings. We could have spent a lot longer with this if we were truly trying to find something specific about it rather than just to explore and see what's in the archives. Um, uh, it is not on display, uh, Tully. Um, so this book is actually in a box. Oh, and Elixie is providing 
the information for you. It's in an acid-free box on a shelf. Uh, I don't know, um, but Elixi, I'm sure you, you probably know better than I do um, about it having been put on display. It is definitely an item that has enough interest to it that displaying it would make sense. Uh, but here's what it would look like in the box. Um, so this box is kind of like just the perfect size for this book. Um, so it doesn't need any extra padding or anything because it basically fits perfectly into this box. And then um, we have a lid to go on the box. Uh, so these are acid-free boxes. These are arch archival storage boxes um, that are from our archival storage vendor, um, which I could throw a name, but I honestly can't remember who we buy our boxes from at the moment. <laughs> um, and I do note here, so it's got our, our label on it with the collection number, um, our barcode for scanning it in our um, library system to like check it out for use. Um, yeah, hashtag not sponsored anyway. Um, but we also have a second barcode on here, uh, which is for Virginia Tech Foundation, which means that it was purchased using foundation funds. Um, and I don't know how much it's worth. Like, I don't know. Typically, foundation items uh, tend to be more, uh, uh, like, for them to be barcoded as a foundation asset. Um, they typically are the more valuable items in our collection. I do not know what the price we paid for this was or um, indeed how much it is worth. Um, and I don't actually have the ability to look that up here. Uh, that Those records are probably in our archival database, but uh, access to that database is restricted to certain IP addresses on campus and uh, I do not believe that in the building or in the room that I am presently in, I can access it. I haven't tried though, but um, Elixir may know if it is of particular value. Um, it's definitely not worth as much as the copies of Ulysses that I shared last week. I can say that for sure. Um, I don't honestly think too much about the. Dust in the throat. Oh, I apologize. I don't honestly think too much about the value of the items when I'm working with them. Um, because if I did, I might freak out. <laughs> um, it's a hundred year old notebook from an architecture student. We don't know who, she, yeah, archival paper dust is <clears throat> a bit. Um, Let's see, I can, I can try. I don't know if it will let me. Oh, yeah, it's, it's too many steps for me to do right now. I may try in the future to see if I can access that database from here, but um, just noting that it has a foundation barcode means that uh, it's likely, one, uh, likely more valuable than some of the other things in our collection. Also likely not as valuable as some of the other things in our collection. But um, we are at the end of time for today. I'm going to double check and see who we're going to send a raid over to. Um, but I do want to thank everybody for coming by. I hope that you found this enjoyable and um, <clears throat> interesting. Next week on the program, I have honestly one of the more challenging things as far as preparing for the episode. Um, which is I decided that next week we are going to look at materials from our archives about olives, which is not the easiest thing to find materials for, even though we have a collection uh, centered on food history. We have a lot of materials on food production and farming and things like that. <clears throat> not many of them are specifically focused on olives, 
or mark the word olives as a keyword. So the few things that actually note olives as a keyword are uh, things from the Bertoli Company, things from the Pompeian Olive Oil Company, um, something from the California Olive Growers Association. Um, <clears throat> those were the easy, easy fruit to, to get. Those were, when I shook the olive tree, those are the things that fell right off. Looking for some of the other things that are in our collection about olives is more challenging because I have to think of where might it be and go and look and see what I can find. But we're going to look at olives because 16-Bit Eric raids this program regularly. And next week will be my uh, next week will be the episode immediately preceding the launch of Eric's new show, Barony of Olives, uh, which starts the Monday after. Uh, so <clears throat> in honor of that, I have chosen to feature olives from our collection. So wish me luck in finding as many olive-related items as I can, and I hope you will join me to find out what I managed to find and to celebrate olives before, uh, before the show Barony of Olives launches. Um, completely selfish on my part choosing that topic, but also just sort of a thank you for uh, Eric constantly rating this program. I do appreciate it. And so chose to just highlight olives in advance of the Barony of Olives. Hi, Galara Dragon. We are closing out for today. I am going to be raiding over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, <clears throat> they are presently featuring their shark cam. Uh, so yeah, wish me luck on finding olive things. Um, it'll be interesting to see what I'm able to find. And that is not what I wanted to click on. I want that button. Uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium. For Shark Cam, that's where we're heading. Oh, you just did an interview about Ultima. Awesome. Um, you, you'll have to share that with me uh, at, at some point in time, because I am closing out the stream right now. So, but I would I would be very interesting to interested to see that. Uh, if you're on the Discord, you can you can drop it there. Um, Yeah, let me finish setting up the raid. And um, yeah, so absolutely, thank you everybody for coming uh, this week. I hope you enjoyed looking at the notebook with me. I uh, hope that I see you again for a future Archival Adventures. We never know what we're going to find in the archives, and I think it is a joy to be able to share them with you as I discover them for myself. Uh, I hope that you find it as enjoyable as I do, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you all for coming and uh, enjoy the Monterey Bay Aquarium on Twitch. Until next time. <laughs>